Amen. Thank you, Brother Dalton. That was tremendous. Boy, encouraging. Touched my heart. Did it touch your heart? I think it did. Boy, you believe? Open your Bibles, 1 John chapter number 5. What makes it easy to preach after somebody like that singing that kind of song? To preach all night. I just may preach all night. So hold on. Thank you. When I get done, you may say again. That's all right. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Brother Dalton, for being willing to sing and, and be willing to let the Lord use you in that way, that tremendous truth. Well, I love being a First Baptist church. No place like it. Glad to be here. Excited for what God is doing here. First John chapter 5, tonight with the Lord's help, we're hoping to finish up the book of First John. The Lord knows we've been in it for long enough. Gone through the whole thing, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now we come to the last few verses. Throughout the book of 1 John, we've seen some very specific ideas that John has presented to us. We find in verse number 3 of chapter 1, we can have fellowship. Overwhelming theme of 1 John is fellowship with God. Not just with something made from stone or from wood, but with the real God of the universe. You can have fellowship. That means you can talk to Him and He'll talk to you. That means you can listen to Him and He'll listen to you. The Bible says you can have fellowship. John says it's so real. He said, we've seen the word of life. We've touched it with our hands. And we've handled the word of life. We've touched the Son of God. And he says, we've written these things unto you that you may have fellowship. You can have the same thing that we had. What a tremendous truth to have fellowship with Jesus. How is your relationship, how is your fellowship with Jesus? My sheep hear my voice. Do you recognize the voice of Jesus, the voice of God in your life? Or does it sound a lot like ESPN? Does it sound a lot like the TV on your house? We can have fellowship, chapter 1 tells us. The end of chapter 1 tells us we can have forgiveness. We can have fellowship, we have forgiveness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That verse is not talking about salvation. It's talking about after salvation. That once we're saved, that sometimes we may mess up. Right? But when we mess up, the Bible says that we can have that fellowship restored. You know, sometimes my kids mess up and they say, Daddy, will you forgive me? No, I won't forgive you. Don't you know you've, you've messed up? You've done blown it this time. In fact, you're walking home from the Upper Peninsula. That's how bad you blew it. What kind of dad would I be? What kind of heavenly father would he be if he wouldn't let us have that fellowship restored? The Bible tells us we have fellowship, but we can have forgiveness. Chapter 2 tells us we can have freedom. These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. John says if we walk in the light, if we walk with God, we can please God in all areas of our life. It's a possibility. He goes on to remind us that we are still human, and, and if we sin, we have a... We have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. But we can have freedom. You don't have to live the way you used to live. That's what John tells us in chapter number 2. You don't have to be bound and be in bondage to those things. You can be free. That's what John says in John chapter 8. It's not to make you free. You'll be free indeed. The truth will set you free. There is freedom in Jesus Christ. And Christian, there's a joy in that freedom. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. What that verse means is when you're right with God, you're not looking over your shoulder. You're walking in freedom. I'm glad to be in a church where we see freedom on a regular basis. Freedom from sin, freedom from habits and addictions, but freedom from bondage. We're in a church where people get saved regularly. That doesn't happen in every church. It doesn't. At church, we have gospel tracts on the way out, on the way in. You can't look very far and can't find, but not find some gospel tracts. That's the freedom. And John says, listen, in, in 1 John, you can have this freedom. So why are you acting like you're in bondage? Why do you keep on putting yourselves back in handcuffs? The Bible says we have freedom. That's what John tells us. He talks to my little children. He says, listen, you can have freedom. We can have fellowship. We can have forgiveness. We can have freedom. We can have a force. Chapter 2, verse 20, we have an unction from the Holy One. How can you do what you do? Because God's Spirit, God Almighty, lives inside of you. You have not just your power, you have His power. Brother Ash just got a new truck the other day. 
Some of you saw that on Facebook. I don't think Marie knows yet, apparently. <clears throat> what a beautiful thing. Love the yellow, love the Dodge. Not as good as an avalanche, but not everyone can drive an avalanche. Can I get an amen? Some of you are an avalanche, right, miss? Thank you, Miss Robinson. Thank you. God bless you. They're blessing. It's okay, though. Next best thing, that Dodge. But he's got a Hemi in that thing. He's got a Hemi in that thing. You know what that means? Easier to get tickets. That's what it means. <laughs> Some of you women don't understand that. Why do you need that big motor in that truck? Because I can. Because they make it. If they didn't make it, then they wouldn't want us to have it, us men to have it. Or because they make it, it must mean it must go inside trucks. Because it can go that high, it means it needs to go that high. At a motorcycle for a little while. I tell you what, there's not much more divisive at First Baptist Church than a pastor owning a motorcycle. Many of you shared your opinions on that with me and my wonderful wife. Some of you who will go nameless tonight went to my wife and said, I can't believe that you'd let your husband have a motorcycle. It's about how you said that to her. She, she gave the message back to me. She said she responded this way. I don't know if you know my husband or not, but if he wants a motorcycle, he's going to get one. But in case you're wondering, she was I wanted him to get one. I loved that motorcycle. I sold it recently so I could get something for the family. But a boy, you say, well, I drive a motorcycle. Because I can. How fast does it go? Only the Lord knows. And me. And I'm not telling <laughs> But we have something far better than a motorcycle or a hemi inside of us. That's the Holy Spirit of God. We have an unction from the Holy One. You say, well, Pastor, how can I have the courage to witness? Because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. How can I live righteously? How can I live like a godly father or a godly mother? How can I be a godly teenager in 2020? Because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. We have a force. Far before Star Wars, there was a force from God. They don't have the corner on the force with us. It's the Holy Spirit inside of you and me. And I'm just in the intro. Still, we have fellowship. We have forgiveness. We have freedom. We have a force. We can have favor. Chapter 3 told us that. Verse number 1. Behold, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us? Why would the God of the universe love somebody like me and somebody like you there is nothing good inside of us apart from Jesus Christ and God. Why would he love us? You know why? Because he wanted to. We love him, the Bible says, because he first loved us. If we love him, it's because he decided to love us. And I'm so glad he did. I look around and I see the blessings from God's love bestowed upon us. Not only are we called the sons of God, as that verse tells us, we're the children of God. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Just sit down a moment and let that sink into your little head, and my little head, that I get to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm called the son of God. That means that one day I get to live with God forever and forever and forever. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. The one who walks on water? The one who commands the winds and the seas? The one who raised Lazarus from the dead? I'm a joint heir with him? Why? Because of his love. And not only do I get those eternal blessings, I get blessings today. I look at my, I talked about my house this morning. I live in a beautiful house. I'm blessed. Why? Not because I'm a good person. Because I have a great God. I have a beautiful family. Why? You know why? Because of God's love. We got an amazing church. Why? Because of God's love. There are places that would die for buildings like this, for people, for members like this. You, tremendous. I, I'm, I'm privileged to be the pastor at First Baptist Church. You make it easy. It's easy to preach behind Brother Dalton singing, isn't it? Any of you could preach. Some of you almost did too. My wife was on her way up here before I stopped her. Oh, you wouldn't like that too much when she gets going. I tell you what, I hear it at home. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'll be outside in the doghouse for sure now. Wonderful church, wonderful church family. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, because of God's love, we have favor. And we can have firmness in our life. That's what Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. I don't have to wonder if I'm going to heaven. I am going to heaven. Why? Because I believed on Jesus Christ. I believe on Jesus Christ. There's no doubt in my mind. I don't have to get resaved. I got saved. 
I was born again, John chapter number 3. Nicodemus, I was born again. And Jesus said, you only have to be born again one time. Not 300 times. We have a firmness. Firmness is comforting because <clears throat> there are some days, there are some days that I just need to know I'm saved. Anybody else with me? There are those days I just need to know I'm saved. No worry about anything else. Just I'm glad I'm on my way to heaven. Some days it seems like they're just bad days. From the moment you wake up, the moment you put your head back down, it just seems like it's not a good day. It's still a good day because God's in control. But you ever feel that way like I do sometimes? Maybe not. I'm the only one. That's okay. I'm glad on those days that I'm going to heaven. Because it feels like that's about all I got going for me at that time. Now it's not, but that's how it feels sometimes. John has taken us on quite the journey. And now he comes to the end of the book. He gives us just a few thoughts, some final thoughts and challenges as he ends this first letter. Remember one time I heard a sermon based on the last verse of the Bible. The man preaching that night said, well, everyone knows that the last thing someone says is the most important thing someone says. I don't know if I agree completely with that, though I know often at the end that is important, but I believe that everything that God said was important to us. All right, but I think there's some truths here as we look at John as he closes out the book, this, this book for us. If you look in verse number 16 of First John chapter 5 where John writes, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in, in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children... Keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Lord, I thank you for this time we have. Lord, I pray you'd help us. We look at these last few little verses, Lord. Give us your wisdom from above, Lord. Would you touch our hearts tonight with your spirit through your word? Lord, you're such a gracious and great God. Lord, you've done so much for me, and I know that we could testify the rest of the night about your goodness to us, but Lord, would you touch us now? Would you meet with us? Lord, I... I believe you've already been inside this service, the music, but already touching hearts. But Lord, don't stop now. We'll give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. If you look at these last few verses, I will not spend the same amount of time that I did previously in the book. So don't worry. I'll give us three final thoughts that John wraps up this book with. Three final words, three final challenges for us as he ends this written material. If you look in verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, If any man sees his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Verses 16 and 17 are, are quite are two verses that have caused quite a bit of consternation in Christendom. If you look at these verses, you'll see that they're verses about, well, if someone sins, you pray for him, and then he won't be under death, but there's a sin under death, and if he sins that one, don't pray for him. All right, but all unrighteousness is sin and pray. And, and I tell you what, as I begin to study these, these particular verses, there are thoughts about these verses all over the place. I can tell you a few things that I know they're not. All right, some would say, well, this is... Praying, this is about praying for someone in purgatory. All right? and no doubt there's an application there. But we know that once someone dies, it, it doesn't matter if you pray at that point. They're either going to heaven or they're separated from God forever. It's appointed a man wants to die, after that the judgment. That's why now is the day of salvation. Right? We're not promised tonight or tomorrow. If you're not saved, make sure today you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Don't put it off. I don't care if you've been in this church for 65 years. No one's going to think ill of you if you come and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. We'll just rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you're online, you've never trusted Jesus Christ, would you trust Him tonight and trust Him today? Don't wait. We don't have a promise of tomorrow. I got a notice. I was, uh, when I woke up from my nap this afternoon, that one of my former classmates just passed away this past week. 
maybe a day and a half ago or two days ago, swimming with their daughter in Lake Michigan, got caught in an undertow, was able to rescue their daughter, 15 years old, I believe, and 44, has now gone on to be with the Savior. We're not promised another day. Struck close to home because I was in Lake Superior this past week. Not Lake Michigan, but Lake Superior. Swimming with my boys and my family. I've been in oceans and big bodies of water. I know what undertow is, but I don't always think about it when I'm swimming. I'm not really always watching for it. I know, I, know it's, I know it's there. It's a real thing. We're not promised any more time. Now is the day to, to follow God in salvation. But these verses aren't necessarily talking about praying for someone out of purgatory. It says if someone sins and is not a death, ask or pray and, and they shall have life. The idea here that I believe is that, J, that John is telling us is one, here's the first word, of supplication. I don't know exactly what the sin unto death is. Someone a whole lot smarter can figure that out. Jesus talked about the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and that could possibly be what John is referring to. I know that Achan sinned and he died and Ananias and Sapphira, they sinned and, and they died. Nabab and Abihu, they sinned and they died. But I know that David, he murdered and he lived. And I know that Moses, he also murdered and he lived. And Paul was consenting to murder and he lived as well. I, I can't begin to know which sin exactly is the one unto death. But I do know this, that you can go to the point where God says, your time here is done. And I know that as a Christian, John is challenging us to pray for other Christians, one of supplication. Or say it this way, it's time to pray for other people. Two weeks ago, I preached and asked this question, how is your prayer life? Many of you texted and responded and said, Pastor, that was a blessing and challenged me. Can I remind you of the question two weeks later? How's your prayer life? Who have you prayed for in the past two weeks? Have you prayed for your kids? Have you prayed for your brother or your sister? Have you prayed for your wife? Have you prayed for your husband? Have you prayed for your governor? Yeah, let me say that one more time. Have you prayed for your governor? You have probably complained about your governor, but you probably haven't prayed for your governor. I would want her job. You can't win, can you? It doesn't matter what decision you'd make. It, it's not, there's no good solution here. The Bible doesn't say to criticize your governor. The Bible says to pray. Pray for those who are in rule over us. Have you prayed for your governor? Have you prayed for your church? I pray every Sunday. I pray that we won't have a COVID-19 outbreak here at First Baptist Church. All right, it's no laughing matter. No, I, I pray that God protects us. We're trying to worship the God of the universe. And I, I, Listen, have you prayed for your church? Have you prayed for the salvation of the lost? Have you prayed for Saginaw? Have you prayed for Bridgeport? Have you prayed for Birch Run? They need Jesus in Birch Run. I'm right by Town Line Road. How's your prayer life? Who have you held up before the throne of God? I'm not talking about what things you had need of. I'm talking about who have you held up before the throne of God. Lord, I pray for so and so. Lord, they need your power in their life. Lord, I'm praying for my family. We need your power in, my life, in our life. Who did you speak to God to on their behalf. How's your prayer life? He says you can pray for your brother. Room full of Christians. Who have you prayed for in this room? Lord, bless so and so. Lord, I saw them sitting there on Sunday and would you bless them? Lord, lift up so and so in our church. How's your prayer life and supplication? We have friends all around us who need God to move and intervene in their lives. We live in a lost and dying world Jesus asks us to pray for more workers, more laborers for the harvest. That's what Jesus asks us to pray for. Who have you prayed for? We're told that if God's people, my people, he says, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God says, I'll heal the land. Who have you made supplication for? Husbands? You prayed for your wife the last two weeks? I hope you can say yes. I hope it's more than one day. Because if all you care about your wife is to pray for her one day in 14 days, you don't love your wife. 
To know that I can approach the throne of grace, God Almighty, and pray for my wife? I pray for Doreen every single day. Every single day. Listen, she, God, God, I need God to help her. Not because she's a rotten person. Don't take that the wrong way. No, no, no. But, but if God says I can ask Him for things, all right, don't get me off track here. You know what I'm saying. All right, when she prays for me, I need Jesus. She doesn't need Jesus. I need Jesus. But I can pray and I can ask God, the Father who gives, which gives good gifts for my wife, and I only pray for her for one day out of 14 days. That's a shame. That's a travesty. If that's you, you better be at that altar tonight. You better pray for your wife tonight. Wives, how about your husbands? Dads, how about your kids? Grandparents, how about your grandkids? Kids, how about your parents? You kids think you have it rough. How about try being your parents? You don't always make it easy there, Johnny, James, and Danielle. It's tough being your, your parents. My wife and I often ask ourselves out loud this question, how could two such intelligent people? You can finish it. You pray for them? I don't know all what those verses mean. I, I, don't, I don't know all that God was trying to tell us. I know he's talking about he, we can pray for the people, though. And I know that part. So when I don't know all what to do, I can do what I know to do. And I can pray. God will take care of the rest. If it's a sin and death, that's his business. My business is to pray. So he finishes out the chapter. He challenges us with supplication. Second thing that he challenges with us is salvation. Verses 18 through 20. Four times he says this. We know, verse 18. Verse 19, we know. Verse 20, and we know. Middle of the verse, that we may know. Three emphatic statements. Three emphatic truths one, he's giving us a truth of protection. Once we're saved, verse number 18 tells us that no one can touch, touch us unless God allows us to be touched. You may think you've got a powerful friend, but I've got God on my side holding me in his hand, holding me fast in his hand. Who can touch me? No one but whom God allows to touch me. And the master's touch is one of compassion, one of molding, one of shaping. We have the idea of protection. I'm safe in his arms. The story told of the early American Indians that they had a unique practice of training young braves. On the night of a boy's 13th birthday, after learning hunting and scouting and fishing, he was put to one final test. Apparently these young braves were put into a forest to spend the entire night alone. Never had they, having been away from the security of the family and the tribe, but on this night they were blindfolded. to be blindfolded and taken several miles away. When the blindfold was removed. They'd be in the middle of a thick woods and often terrified. Every twig that would snap, every branch, every little acorn that would drop would be visualized as a wild animal ready to pounce. After what seemed like an eternity, dawn would break. The first rays of sunlight... But what these boys would find out is when their eyes would become accustomed to light, they'd see flowers and trees and outline of a path. But to their astonishment, they would always behold the figure of a man just a few feet away, armed with a bow and arrow. And what would always happen is the boy's father would always stand by all night long to watch over their son as they became a brave. And there are some times in your life and my life when the night seems dark. When every twig that snaps seems like it's an animal waiting to pounce. Every acorn that drops seems like it's a predator around the corner. That life just seems like it's jumping. But don't forget that God is right next to us. And he's got the biggest bow and arrow. And he never misses. You see, we know because of salvation we have protection. We know that we're peculiar. We're different. It's verse 19. So the Bible tells us. We know the word of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. You're going to be different because of your salvation than everyone else around you. That's what John tells us. He closed out the verse. He said, don't forget you're different. You're going to be different. Your difference shows your distinction. Evangelist Gypsy Smith told of a man who had received no inspiration from the Bible, though he had his words gone through it several times. Gypsy Smith replied to this man, let it go through you. Then you will tell a different story. 
Don't go through the Bible. Let the Bible go through you. Pastor Let years ago, when he was preaching at the end of the year, going into the new year, often challenging the church on reading through the Bible, he made this statement, read the Word of God until it affects you. It's a great statement. Let the Word of God change you. A well-known and highly respected judge came forward at the invitation in a Bible-preaching church to trust Christ as a Savior. And the pastor was so thrilled that this judge would come for salvation. He asked the judge, was it my sermon that made you decide to trust Christ? Like a lawyer, you should never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. The judge smiled and said, well, pastor, I mean no offense, but my trusting Christ had nothing to do with your sermon. You see, I have a devoted Christian who serves as my maid. She speaks of the Lord Jesus. She tells of his love, and she has a wonderful Christian testimony in front of me all these years. The reason I got saved was not because of your sermon. It was because of the message of my maid. You're going to work. You're going to live in a lost and dying world. Be the message of Jesus Christ. That salvation means that you're different. Be the message. But also it brings us perspective. That's verse number 20. Being saved brings us a perspective. Verse 20 tells us that there's a singular truth. Because of salvation, we find out what truth is and who is true, and that is God. In this day and age, it's no new. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon says. But we live in a day and age where truth is relative. Truth is whatever you want it to be. If you want to be a different gender, you're allowed to be. Truth is relative. If you want to believe the earth is still flat, you're allowed to. Truth is relative. You can do whatever you want to do as long as you don't tell someone else what they're doing is wrong. You can make up your own truth. But God says truth is not relative. Truth is found in a singular manner. It's found in God Almighty. Truth is found in Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is found in God that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Don't forget, there is no truth apart from God. You want to be smart? Read your Bible. You want to know truth? Know God. He said things about the world before everyone else knew it. He he said the earth was round before they knew it was round. He talks about the stars. They were numerous in the heavens before they knew that. They thought they could count them. You want to know truth? Then you know God. You see, Romans 1 tells us, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became, the Bible says, fools. I don't have to look very long online to find some fools. There's crazy out there. You think I'm crazy. There's crazy out there. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Sometimes you read something, you hear something, you're like, oh my goodness. Where did this come from? Right there, Romans chapter 1. Rejecting the truth from God's word. You see that people turn aside from their natural affections. That that even means not only in the movement we have right now, but also that parents don't love their children. You've heard about some of those stories where, where parents take the lives of their children. How could you do that? Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, right here. You see, with salvation, we find that there's singular truth in the perspective but there's also saving life. That's the end of the verse. Number 20 tells us that this is a true God and eternal life. Now, don't miss this in verse number 20. As John closes out this book, he reminds us of our eternal life. Kind of like it's a really good deal. Kind of like it's a really special thing. Kind of like it's a really powerful idea. Kind of like it's an amazing thing that we have, life from Jesus Christ. We've never been more alive than when we were alive in Jesus Christ. How about John chapter 1, verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. John chapter 5, for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. John chapter 5, verse 40, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. John chapter 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John chapter 6, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Jesus saith unto her, John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, 
in the life. You remember this gift of life? You have eternal life. There's an old song, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to die, no, never. Jesus died on the tree for me, and I'm going to live forever. And it's going to be a wonderful life in heaven. Walking on streets of gold, serving the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, eating from the tree of life, a different fruit in every single month. You walk up one month, there's watermelon sitting on that tree. See, I told you kids that watermelons grew on trees. Gates of pearl, there's a gift of life. Lastly, verse 21. See, there's supplication, there's salvation. Last, we have separation. He finishes the whole book with one little verse. He says, little children. I think when he says little children, if I can bring to our mind, as he finishes up this book, maybe he wants him to remember a few things. This whole book, he's used this little phrase, little children. Remind them that he's their spiritual father. He brought them the, the truth of the gospel. And this, this, this people, the people that would have been written to by John were surrounded by idol worship. They were inundated with false gods. They most likely had family and friends who worshipped false gods. Everywhere they looked, they saw in truth. And he says, little children, do us well to remember our heritage. I'm a child of God. Remember your background. Remember your spiritual parents. Do you remember who led you to the Lord? Little children. Remember your salvation, remember your freedom, remember your growth, remember your frailty, remember. And then he says this, keep yourselves from idols. I entitled the message tonight, Live for God. Last thing John says, little children, remain. Remain pure, keep yourselves from idols. Remain holy, keep yourselves from idols. Remain singular. Keep yourselves from idols. Remain separated. Keep yourselves from idols. Remain devoted. Keep yourselves from idols. Remain clean. There were two students walking down the streets of London when they saw a sign for used clothes. The sign said this, according to what they said, slightly soiled, greatly reduced in price. Definitely is not a current story because they don't sell slightly soiled clothes nowadays. But as these two students, seminary students were talking, one said, that's exactly what happens in our lives, isn't it? Slightly soiled, greatly reduced in price. Soiled by looking at something we shouldn't look at reading something we shouldn't read or listening to something we shouldn't list, list, listen to, allowing our minds to walk down paths we shouldn't walk down. When our time comes for our character to be appraised, we're greatly reduced in value. Our purity, our strength is taken away just like it was with Samson because we've not kept ourselves from idols. Our usefulness for God is hindered because we've not kept ourselves from idols. What do idols look like? Any shape, any form. In America, they can look like a truck. They can look like clothes. They can look like shoes. We think sometimes an idol has to be like a Buddha in our house, and I don't believe any of you have a Buddha in your house. That would be just as wrong. But in America in 2020, we have so much wealth that many of us worship wealth. That's what makes us excited. That's where we find our comfort and our hope in. After a violent storm one night, a large tree was found on its side. When they looked at the middle of the tree, they found out that though it appeared to be large and sturdy, upon closer examination, it was rotten to the core because thousands of tiny insects had eaten it out from the inside out. The weakness of the tree was not brought on by the storm, but by the insects ravaging the inside. 
The weakness of the Christian is not brought on by the storm, but by all the weakness, the insects devouring us from the inside. See, John finishes the chapter of the book and he says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Lord, I pray you'd help us. Lord, I want to live for you. Lord, you know I want my life to count for you. Lord, help us as you give us your word to listen to your spirit. Just a moment, the piano will play. Stand to our feet. I wonder if God spoke to you tonight. I wonder if there's part of your supplication that needs a change. I wonder if you've forgotten the joy of your salvation. I wonder if there's some separation. Lord, help this time. Lord, search us, know us, try us, but help us be honest. In Jesus' name. As we stand to our feet, the instrument's already playing. The altar's open.